So uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, uh, Marisa Hammond. Uh, Marisa is the Chief Technology Officer at Utility Data Inc. And she is also uh, a, a governing board member for uh, LF Energy. Uh, for those who uh, do not know uh, what LF Energy is, uh, um, LF Energy is the, one of the Linux Foundation projects that bring the uh, energy you know, industry together. So that includes you know, uh, like, uh, uh, Greek companies and software vendors and uh, even like, uh, academia. So I mean, she is the uh, governing, uh, uh, one of the uh, governing, board governing board member of that project. And today, uh, Marisa will be uh, uh, talking about the, the uh, redefining de uh, electric grid operations from the edge with open distributed AI. So please welcome Marisa Hammond. <clears throat> Good morning and thank you. Uh, appreciate your attention and I hope to convince you by the end of this talk um, of three things. First is that the edge of the grid, um, where the utility meets the customer, is gonna change very quickly over the next seven to 10 years. Um, second, that our current tools are really not uh, set up to, or, or have not prepared us well to handle that. Um, and that third, that what we really need to do as an open source community is respond to that with open distributed AI. My name is Marissa Hummen. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Utilidata, um, a real-time grid operations company that spent the last 10 years operating the grid both centrally and from the edge in. Um, I'm also a governing board member for LF Energy. I started my career at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory studying um, how we were going to, as a, <laughs> as a country and as a, as a world, quickly transition off of fossil fuel driven uh, generation to solar and wind generation. Um, we built digital twins before we had that word, um, you know, that's now in, in vogue, but um, we simulated the grid at a very detailed level to understand what were, where were the opportunities for changing how we would do things, um, for simplifying and, and making things more cost effective. And what became very apparent to me was that the edge of the grid where we use energy, where we decide what we want to plug in, had a lot more flexibility and inherent um, scalability than we'd ever given uh, credit to. And from there, I spent the last uh, eight to 10 years of my life um, trying to bring technologies into the commercial space that really exploited that, um, that flexibility and, uh, and that scalability um, in order to lower that cost of the energy transition. Um, I joined LF Energy a couple of years ago, and our company did, um, at the invitation of the uh, then executive uh, director, Shuli Goodman. Um, she and I had been colleagues and friends for many years, and she had a vision that if we could just uh, bring together the community of technologists under this banner of, of open, uh, open source technologies, open source standards, um, specifications, that we would really lower the cost of that energy transition and, um, and speed up the, the pace with which we could do that. Um, the other piece of that puzzle, from my perspective, is, is the commercial side of that. So, you know, where open source technologies meet commercialization is where we can really make that change happen. And so, um, Utilidata uh, started um, about 10 years ago when um, the United States had a, a big push towards the smart grid. Um, the smart grid technologies are uh, now, uh, it's almost like a, uh, a bad word because um, we, we labeled maybe them a little bit too early. They didn't turn out to be very smart uh, 10 years ago. Um, but the, but the, the, uh, the goal at the time was to digitize the grid, um, use that digitization to create um, a real-time picture of the grid, and then use that picture then to optimize it. And so uh, over the last five years, um, uh, under my leadership for the research and development, we've been taking that technology to the edge of the grid. So, what do I mean by the edge of the grid? Um, this is, uh, first and foremost, where the utility, the electric company, ends and where the customer begins, both residential customers, industrial and commercial customers. Um, it is where most of the change is going to happen. In this room, my guess is that probably only one in 20 of you own an electric vehicle. But by the end of this decade, I would bet one in two of you will own an electric vehicle. 
You'll probably want to plug that vehicle in close to your house, if not at your house. You'll also probably want to plug it in at work, um, maybe even when you're at the grocery store. Um, for places where there's a dense population in, in urban areas, uh, you can imagine that the street will now be lined with EV charging. Your grid is not prepared to handle that. The grid is an old, a very old object, uh, you know, started probably, you know, the, roughly between 1920 and 1950, and was really designed um, with the idea that we would serve lighting, maybe eventually some heating, um, but d was not prepared for things like electrification of vehicles. But yet, um, we are going to see an explosion of those. So not just electric vehicles, but we'll also see a transition to heat pumps, so off of natural gas heating or even oil heating and to electrified heating. We'll also see an increase in the adoption of solar and storage technologies, in part due to economics and in part due to resiliency. Both of those things come into play. The economic piece happens really fast. You only have to look to Australia for an example of that. Um, when the payback period for solar reaches less than three years, uh, the adoption rate goes through the roof. So now about one in every three houses or businesses in, in Australia has solar on its roof. And they had, a they had to go through a very massive change in how they thought about operating that grid in order for that grid to stay upright. In Japan, there are about 2,500 power plants. We think of these as the big power plants, right? Uh, coal burning power plants, natural gas power plants. If every household, if every business, if every endpoint or edge of the grid suddenly has solar and storage and electric vehicles, now all of those are endpoints. Sorry, no, now all of those are power plants. That means there are going to be 80 million power plants in Japan. The utility right now can handle, uh, you know, coordinating and dispatching about 2,200 power plants. 80 million is a much, much larger number. And in places where that change has happened quickly, um, what we have seen is, sorry, oh, is this? Okay, is this on? Okay, great. All right, well, where that change has happened quickly, um, the grid is now considered at capacity. In the Netherlands, over the course of about 10 months, the grid went from a, uh, to being able to handle new connections for industrial plants or data centers to not being able to connect any new loads nor new solar. And it crept up on them because of some changes in the politics and economics of where they were getting their energy. I would contend that this is going to happen just about everywhere in the world, just at different times. So in some places where they are very dependent on natural gas today, um, this transition might happen very soon. In other places, it might take a little bit longer. But if we agree that the grid is going to reach capacity, then we have to figure out how we want to, um, how we want to respond to that. When the, when the electric company decides um, that the grid is at capacity, they're using a very specific measurement for what capacity means. They take the worst case scenario. Everybody is running their air conditioner at the same time, plugging their electric vehicle in at the same time. On the, for, for, the, for, the, for the single one hour peak load, that's what they measure the capacity to be. But if you took the average energy use over the whole year, most grids are at about 30% capacity. So we, we build an extra 70% to handle that one hour of coincident peak load and generally don't use that. <laughs> um, and that means that there's a lot of opportunity for us to utilize more of the grid without actually changing um, our infrastructure without necessarily building things. So I would contend we have three options for the future. One is that we do nothing. We slow down electrification. We slow down decarbonization. We give ourselves the chance to uh, catch up under our normal build plans. The second is that we try to build our way out of it. Um, I would say this is expensive, um, probably not really realistic. Uh, there are both uh, material shortages, supply chain shortages, labor shortages that make that a very unrealistic uh, um, path forward. 
Or the last is that the energy community needs to embrace technologies that other industries have already done. Um, things like manufacturing automation, just-in-time delivery of materials, um, the optimization of supply chains, even discoveries in medicine or fintech. Those, what those uh, technologies all have in common is the use of digitization, so let's make measurements, turn them into data, um, and then making decisions in real time and coordinating those decisions. So if you were to apply that concept to the energy industry, what we start with on this you know, far side here is visibility. Um, you would be surprised how many substations in the world have almost no data being reported back to the electric company. Probably about 40% of them. So 40% of them, uh, the utility company only knows if something went wrong if it's literally on fire. That's a problem we could solve today. <laughs> um, once you have, though, visibility, you can move to better forecasting. And from forecasting, you can move to then real-time management. And then by the time you get all the way to the future, we should be able to dynamically respond to the conditions that are, um, that are in play today or at this moment and, um, and automatically uh, create resiliency um, and efficiency. So if this progression is to happen, what I would contend is that we need uh, a distributed AI platform that allows for this to happen. And it needs to be based on open source technologies in order to increase the credibility of that tech, and in order, sorry, in order to increase the credibility, but also to support the innovation that we know needs to happen. There are kind of three things that I think, I hopefully I've convinced you of in the last uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, first is that uh, the endpoints of the grid are going to become increasingly complex. Um, there's going to be an exponential change in how those uh, endpoints are going to operate. Second is that that change is going to produce a set of coupled systems that when solved really require a new type of mathematics um, in order to solve them. And then lastly, that by bringing, um, by bringing the uh, the computation and the decision making to the edge of the grid. We both avoid the latency issues of that round trip communication and also we avoid any privacy issues with the data. So here's a, a small example. This is probably going to seem incredibly uh, trivial to you guys, but this is something that the utility has almost no visibility in today. What, you, what is happening at a particular endpoint um, in terms of the energy use, does determine how the utility wants to respond to this. This is an example of how when, when we are measuring um, locally and computing locally, we can detect in real time the difference between an oven starting and an EV starting to charge. No one should tell you when you can cook, but it turns out that charging your EV is actually a fairly flexible process. Generally, you're plugged in for longer than you actually need in order to, um, in order to build, uh, sorry, in order to um, charge the car. So this demonstrates that you can have real-time uh, detection of information, and you can use that information locally then to create um, the right kind of response. LF Energy is, um, is the home of a lot of such projects. Um, they range from edge of grid operations all the way to the um, to central operations, um, market operations, you know, back through kind of, uh, of uh, power flow optimization, and is really trying to underpin uh, a you know a, a a change in how the utility system, or sorry, the utilities um, pursue these options. I think this is really important because this uh, this is how I. I got involved with them as the, um, a project called the Super Advanced Meter. We had, uh, we'd run out of the word smart grid. Um, we maybe overused that one, and so we decided this would be the Super Advanced Meter. And the Super Advanced Meter um, under LF Energy is an is a open source standardization project, um, trying to develop a set of standards for what that hardware um, architecture would look like, as well as what the use cases are to justify that, um, that investment. 
Utilidata is um, helping to bring that technology to the market. Um, we call it Carmen. Carmen is a platform um, for the software-defined grid. It is built on top of a uh, it's built on top of a NVIDIA um, IoT chip, the Jetson Nano, and it is designed to link the grid with the things that are quote behind the meter, with EV chargers, with um, solar inverters and batteries. But it is also meant to be a key part of grid operations. So the measurements that you get right at the edge of the grid, right at the meter, um, can tell you what's happening in terms of power flow, but also tell you what happens behind the meter. So this foundation can be, uh, can be spread throughout the grid in places like data centers, um, transformer boxes, uh, even commercial and industrial sites. With an open software-defined grid, we could set the stage for using distributed AI to create that efficient and, uh, and equitable <laughs> um, and rapid transition to a decarbonized and electrified future. I'll leave you with this last simulation. So this, um, this is an example of how if you have the right computation and the right software-defined platform at the edge of the grid, we can dispatch locally uh, the resources that right now we treat as fairly dumb. The inverters and the EV chargers, um, even your heating and cooling system, for the most part right now, don't respond to any sor sort of signal, but all of them have that capability. And it's up to us as a community as to how we want to respond to that. So I think what I want to conclude with, I guess, is a, a call to action to this, this community. Um, the, the energy transition is going to require layers upon layers of technology, and the open source community has the expertise um, and the, uh, the skills and the experience to really drive that change. Um, so please support LF Energy, um, and more importantly, uh, you know, keep doing the good work that you guys are doing. Thank you.